Hello, welcome to WebPixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WebPixel. I'd like to introduce you to our res resident photographic expert, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hey, Adam. Good to see you. Good to see you too. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. So, Alex today is going to introduce his five favourite seahorse images, obviously very iconic subject. So, straight on over to you, Alex. Well, thanks. I, I think so, um, I was uh, my, my daughter was asking me the other day what my favourite fish in the, the sea is. Wow. And I have to say, I think I'm a real seahorse addict. Um, I love seeing seahorses of all types. It's always a special moment when I see them. And I, I've seen loads and loads, actually. When you asked me to dig these out, I had a quick look through my files. And I had 150 plus pictures of them to try and choose from <laughs> um, to pick out some favorites. And it's very much a, a top five for today. I don't think necessarily these are my strongest seahorse pictures, but they're the ones I really wanted to talk about. Yep. So the first one is um, taken in Seahorse Central. So the place that I've been, which is the most has had the most seahorses, is New South Wales in Australia. Right. And I was amazed how many seahorses were there. And I know Dave Harasti, one of the seahorse scientists, or he's a um, marine conservation scientist, but he does a lot of seahorse research. I know he counted, I think, more than 200 once on a dive in New South Wales when doing surveys. So wow. it's an amazing place for seahorses. And this is a white seahorse. Um, actually, I don't, I'm not sure if it is a white sea. I can't remember what species it is. Um, it's, I, I should have done. Yeah, no, it is a white seahorse. In, 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 uh, now I look at the picture. Yeah, so it's a white seahorse in taken in very murky water in um, Sydney Harbour, in just one of the, the sort of the bays within Sydney Harbour. And seahorses love protected water. Yeah. They hate waves, and anywhere where there's shelter from waves, you've got a good chance of finding seahorses. And actually, I find, I always joke that one of the best ways to find seahorses is to look for where yachts anchor because yachts and yeah. seahorses have the same habitat preference. But actually, any protected waterway is often a very good place to find seahorses, yeah. as, as long as the seahorse is in that, that region. And this was take, taken there. And this picture, is, it just remained a favorite because it really, this trip taught me so much about seahorses. I learned a great deal about their behavior. I got to see and photograph one giving birth for the first time on this wow. trip. And um, although they're not the most spectacular colored, you know, it's a standard brown seahorse. Actually, the more you spend time with seahorses, the more you realize a great number of them are just brown. And um, that's part of their camouflage. The way they live their lives is by being this kind of invisible animal yep. that doesn't look like anyone expects a fish to look. Yep. And as a result, almost just slips through unnoticed, ignored by predators and its prey. And um, humans. And, yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I just like this picture because it's also, it's kind of, this for me is that kind of perfect portrait of a seahorse in terms of the angle. Seahorses, underwater photographers know are very shy, very inclined to sort of turn away and sort of look back at you. Um, and I just love the fact that this one was clearly super relaxed with me, just sitting there watching the world go by. And uh, this picture has always remained a favorite for me, even though it's in murky water, even though it's a brown seahorse. Mm. For my second shot, I'm going to take you to the clear waters of the Canary Islands. Um, and this picture here is a short snouted seahorse, as we call them in Europe. Um, I think it's a short snout. It could be a gutulatus, but I think it's a short snout. Um, taken in the Canary Islands, which are part of Spain, but they're actually a group of islands off the west coast of Africa in the East North Pacific, North Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And the, uh, there's a few of the bays there are quite well protected, have quite nice little seahorse populations. And I uh, really enjoyed photographing this one. And this picture here was awarded in the Asperico Nature Competition um, probably 10 years ago now. But it's always remained a favorite for me because one of the things I'm always looking to do when I photograph seahorses is I think everybody in the world could recognize the silhouette of a seahorse. Yep. So when I shoot seahorses, I want that recognizable silhouette to wind its way through my picture. And I think this picture really captures that. This is um, a female um, seahorse in this picture but the, her shape of the way she winds through the picture um, is, is really nice and I used a slightly long exposure here to get that blue background coming in to help the silhouette stand out against the algae and I really like how the algae is rendered with its slight movement slight blurriness in the in the in the in the water movement I really I really I've always really liked this picture and again it, it's one that you know okay maybe it's not my like the previous one not one of my best pictures by modern standards but uh, it's a picture that at the time I took it, which is more than a decade ago now, um, was a real favorite. Yep. I'm mm -hmm. going to come a bit more up to date now. And this is a picture I took last year and was actually awarded in the 
the GDT um, European Nature um, European Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition last last year, and I, I like this picture because I think many many years ago, I think probably twenty years ago, photographers were already saying to each other, "There's no point photographing any more pygmies. All the shots have been done. You'll never get um, you know nothing unique uh, out there. Stand out image." And actually, you know, I always like to challenge myself to try and do something different with them. And this is a classic example of a small in the frame pygmy. Rather than trying to show how small a pygmy is by making it as big as possible in the final image, I challenge myself to take a picture where the picture still works, but the pygmy was as small as I thought I could get away with in the picture to really show its amazing adaptation to this habitat. And I think for viewers who aren't familiar with the subject, this picture begins to communicate quite how small it is. Yep. I think people still think it's you know this sort of size rather than that sort of size, but at least they get the impression that this is some tiny, tiny little animal um, in, in thing. And um, this picture here, and I was, I was going to show you another quick pygmy shot. It's not one of my five, I'm quick to add. Um, <laughs> uh, and another Denise pygmy, like the last one. Um, but something that I try and do with my pygmy shots, with the pygmies like the Denises and the Bargibantes that live in sea fans, is to always try and capture them with the polyps out. Yeah. Now, sea fans naturally often have their polyps in, but I think if you shoot pygmies with the polyps out, first of all, the sea fan looks prettier like that. Yeah. But I think it's got this subtext message that you weren't harassing the subject to get your shot. Yeah. If you poke and prod pygmies into position for pictures, and I know most people don't, but some people do, um, when you try and touch them or touch the sea fans and move them into position, if you touch the sea fan, all the polyps go in. Yep. So one of the nice things about showing a picture with the polyps out is people can look at that picture and they know that you've gone about things in the right way. Yep. Um, I think you'd agree with that one, Adam. Absolutely, yeah. It's one of my one of my hobby horses. I'm afraid, um, you know, there's, there's when the polyps are out, we know that uh, that the, the, the fan has not been subject to touch. Uh, something else I like that uh, dive guides are not above doing in some parts of the world, and that they'll actually touch the fan to make it easier to find the pygmies as well. So um, mm. so in both cases, you know. I would say that in general, whilst you know, if you come across a fan and the polyps are in, it's got pygmies on it, by all means take pictures of them. But I would suggest that the ones that you share or the ones that you want to share be the ones that show the polyps out. I mean, everyone's in no doubt as to as to how the picture was captured. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it, it gives it gives people a reassurance that there was no no foul play. Yeah. That said, there's a huge number of pictures taken of pygmies with the polyps in that also are taken in exactly the right way. Of and I don't think we should be too judgmental about it. It's just nice to stand up behind those yeah. those shots that yeah. everyone knows are done in the right way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stick in Indonesia, but move from Raja Rampat, where the last two pictures were taken, um, to Lembe now, and show you uh, my my fourth picture, which is a sea zebra. Um, everyone knows that, you know, stripy horses are zebras, yep. and this is a stripy seahorse. This is actually a type of... Um, of three spot seahorse that comes in this rather unusual striped pattern. And um, this was in, in Lembe on one of the muck sites. And here I've just used a long exposure to capture a feeling of a little bit of movement um, from the subject. But actually the main reason I was using the long exposure is the, it was a beautiful seahorse, but boy was it on ugly black sand. And the long exposure was more about making the sand look pretty. Than Hiding the background. Else. Yeah. I was just trying to do something to, you know, it's such an amazing seahorse. And I was yeah. like, this seahorse is beautiful and this sand is ugly. Yeah. Um, and it was just really the only way by using that long exposure, using accelerated panning technique um, with front curtain sink, I was able to freeze the seahorse and just give a nice sweeping blur to the seabed. And I actually really like the textures in the seabed. Yeah. I think it creates really. I think it's a really good example of, of how we should think creatively as well. You know that you know quite often the subjects aren't where we want them to be, so that's when we need to resort to the tools in our technical arsenal to 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 find a creative way of portraying that animal. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Mm. Yeah. And then my final one of my five is a pair of seahorses mating. Right. Um, it's not the world's best shot at all. But again, I wanted to put my favorites in rather than my best shots. Yep. And this shot here shows two um, seahorses mating in Florida. This right. was actually taken on a wet pixel Bahamas trip. Um, but actually we started the trip on the Shearwater in, in Florida. And the night before we set off to the Bahamas, we did a day's diving in, in a Blue Heron Bridge, yeah. but diving from the dive boat rather than from the shore. And I managed on that dive to 
get um, both mating long arm octopuses and mate, this mating seahorses on the same dive. Wow. Uh, which I was very pleased about seeing. Good start. Yeah, it was a very good start to you know what was actually a really amazing um, summer summer trip, and this is back in two thousand and eight. So another old picture, but it's it's one that's remained a favourite. It's not a perfect shot of mating actually. When you get seahorses mating, it is possible to get them much more symmetrical to each other than this shot shows, um, and I think they look graphically stronger when they're really facing each other like that. Yeah. But this is the best I got on the the chance I got with the seahorses, um, and it remains a favourite of mine because it shows that really interesting behavior. I've never actually done a lot of dedicated seahorse photography. Um, I've always enjoyed seeing them when I've seen them, but I've never really done many trips focused on them. But I would really love to photograph more of these sort of behaviors. Um, I'd really love to spend time following them and have the chance to shoot mating, have the chance to shoot giving birth really properly at some point. Um, I just, it's, it's not being compatible with the sort of diving I'm doing at the moment. I think it's one of the things about so seahorses. I'm going to cheat. I think one of the things about yeah, seahorses uh, is is the uh, is that they are very prevalent and they are in a lot of places places that we often don't expect to find relatively exotic animals. You know, you'll often find seahorses. So yeah, no, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm, and I'm actually going to cheat and um, use what you just said um, to show you a picture that I've read. <laughs> Unlike um, you, Alex. And that's um, this shot here of a British seahorse. Wow. And I, I wanted to talk about this because it's it's rather an unusual situation in the UK. In the UK, we have the same seahorses that are found across pretty much the rest of, of Europe, certainly Europe's south and east of us. So sort of from the Netherlands right down through through you know France and Spain and Portugal and then round through the Mediterranean. Yeah. We have two seahorse species which are known as the short snouted seahorse and the spiny seahorse yeah. um, or the long snouted seahorse sometimes called as well. Um, and this is a long snouted seahorse taken in the UK and we're kind of at the top end of the range. And for various reasons, um, seahorses in the UK have been protected, which is a good thing. But the reason I say various reasons with my eyebrows slightly raised is that for more personal reasons, I think sort of the personal disagreements between various seahorse conservationists, um, they, they got seahorse photography listed as, as a potential source of harm to seahorses in the uk mm. and so so what happens in the uk what happened in the uk is they got the species list the species listed as a protected species within the uk where that we want to look after this species to keep it in the uk and being at the northern end of its limits um you know it, it is a species That's that you know rare. we're lucky to have here yeah. um or two species because there's obviously two species in the uk um and so they've protected them against disturbance and the main causes of disturbance are habitat destruction and particularly boat anchorages, because as I was saying at the beginning, boats love the same sort of habitat as seahorses to anchor in. And habitat destruction from boat anchors, particularly on seagrass meadows, is, is it can be really a big issue for, for seahorses in the UK. Um, but anyway, photography has kind of got lumped in with this as a potential source of disturbance. So in order to take this picture, I had to apply, or when I first started, to Natural England, who are a government conservation organisation in the UK, um, who were controlling the licenses initially, and then it passed over to the marine management organization who, who basically took the same same system on. And to, to be able to take this picture, I had to have a license from the government to go and disturb seahorses by taking pictures of them, even though I photographed these species of seahorses all across Europe and have never disturbed them by taking their pictures. Here in the UK, it's considered one. As a result, there's very few pictures of seahorses in the UK and I think that's a real loss for our oceans. People aren't celebrating these amazing animals because yeah. no one ever sees pictures of them. Yeah. Now, from a purely selfish point of view, it's great for me because I have a picture of a seahorse in the UK that's legal and I can sell this picture and this picture sells everywhere. The two scientists who've actually studied seahorses and the impact of, of flash photography on them have both concluded in the only peer-reviewed journals papers about this issue um, that there's no harm in flash photography. Yep. There is a real hard point of disturbance if you start poking and putting them around, yep. then they might leave the area. Yep. But their studies clearly showed that flash photography, even the extreme amounts that they did for their testing, um, had really no impact. And actually, seahorses, they generally live in very shallow water. Certainly in the UK, they do. And it's very bright yep. in those conditions. And, and really, you know, you know, something that lives deep and dark and always in a cave might be disturbed by flash. But a seahorse that lives in very shallow, bright water, you know, in this seahorse here, I could stand up and put my head out the water when I took this picture. I think there's a bit of anthropomorphizing that goes on. I think uh, yeah. because they often turn away, 
and people would assume, therefore, the, the the Flash is 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 responsible for them doing that. But I think that's just a natural defensive behaviour. I'm not sure it's got anything to do with, with the, the actual flashing at all. I think it's just that we're getting close to them. Well, I think they just turn it. away naturally from yeah. anything bigger than them, yeah. so that they just because you know if they're si- if they're sideways on, they've got a bit of a recognisable shape. Yeah. If they're end on, the predator's yeah. not going to recognise exactly. Them. It's, it's, a, it's a it's anyway. A, um, anyway, that's that's an aside, but it's yeah, an interesting yeah. area because it's something that underwater photographers globally don't necessarily come across very much is yeah. the fact that there's actually maybe a, a subject out there you're not allowed to photograph unless of course you've got the the correct license as is the case in the uk i'm a really big supporter of looking after seahorses and particularly the habitats that they rely on in the uk in order to, to still be here yeah. and i must admit i've not seen a seahorse in the uk since i took these pictures so yeah. um and these these were taken um back in 2010 so it's been 10 years since I've seen a seahorse in the UK. So they're not everywhere, but then I, I'm not diving there that much. But anyway, I, I thought that was a really interesting thing to finish on. Indeed, yeah. Um, images are beautiful as always, Alex. Where can everyone see more of your seahorse imagery? Uh, easy peasy. Go to amustard.com, search box at the top of the website, type seahorse, and you'll see all the pictures I should and, have chosen. And there'll be hundreds of them because they're your favourite subject. Yeah. You've already told us that. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing those with us, Alex. Um I'd like to thank you all for watching. Um, please visit our sponsor, XIT404. Um, um, please subscribe to the channel to get notified when we add additional episodes in the future. And if you like the video, like it, and add any comments that are relevant. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.